Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. It has been a minute. It's been a little while, I think about two weeks since I've uploaded a series 10 video. Um, and I figure I should probably explain myself. Uh, and the reason is because I am very bored of series 10. I think a lot of us are pretty bored of series 10 at this point. The format is not really progressing at all. It feels pretty solved at this point. Um, it, the teams are basically the same teams that did well in the Victory Road World Cup Open in the end of July two months ago. Uh, I was looking at the teams that did well in like the Desafio tournaments, and they are literally one mon different, every single one of them, with the exception of this team that Santi used in the Players' Cup Invitational that happened two weeks later, right? So the, the format really hasn't changed in about a month and a half, and it, it just isn't fun to play. Uh, it isn't fun to watch. Uh, it just like isn't fun to team build in, and um, that being said, if you have broken the metagame or you have a really cool team or you do well in a tournament, I'd still love to have Series 10 content on the channel in terms of team reports, so feel free to reach out to me there. But, whoa, editing. Okay, so I made this graphic after I made the video, and while I think it does a really good job of conveying what I wanted to show in this video, or at least the early part of the video, um, I also wanted to add a little addendum because um, I really don't want to uh, make it seem like any of these players were just blatantly stealing their teams. Not that there's anything wrong with blatantly stealing teams. I actively encourage you to steal teams all the time and try them out for yourself. But um, I know these players worked really hard on their teams, really optimized them for the metagame, and the metagame has shifted a little bit, um, and you really do need to continue to optimize your teams, as you see with, like, David Ness's team, um, which, you know, I know, should, I know he's been working on basically the entire format. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, point out that there were some teams that didn't convert nearly as well. Not every team from two months ago has done really well uh, moving on. Uh, like the Palkia team that won this tournament is not very good anymore. Lunala popped up and then kind of died down. Uh, the Entei Groudon stuff uh, with Cherim was really good for like a 10-day period and then everyone adjusted to it. Uh, but my overall point is that the best teams look pretty much the same. And if I want to win a tournament, if I were entering a tournament tomorrow, which I might be, and uh, if I was trying to win that tournament, which I will be, then I would probably be using pretty much the same team as if I were trying to win a tournament from, you know, July 31st. And that's kind of the point, and it's really disappointing. So, okay, back to what I recorded earlier. This video is going to be a little bit more of a reflection. And the reason I want to do this video is because JUX9 made a tweet titled The Future of VGC. And you can see it on screen right now, and you should definitely read the entire thing because it is really insightful. Uh, and, you know, it has a lot of the same thoughts that I was thinking as well. Um, and I wanted to make a video like this for a little while, but this gave me a really opportune time to do it. Um, so in this discussion, he talks about uh, the formats that we've had over the last year or two, um, the length of formats, announcement of formats, the frequency of the tournaments that TPCI is hosting, um, as well as some critique of the broadcasts. And so again, really good read. I agree the most of the stuff that he said, but I wanted to talk about um, basically a reflection of VGC 2021. What went well, what went poorly, um, and then maybe what VGC 2022 is going to look like because uh, we did just have that announcement that VGC 2022 is going to be on Sword and Shield. The Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are not going to support uh, online ranked play. Um, and so it's going to be like, <laughs> this is going to be the third year on the same game. This is the first time we've ever had that in VGC history. Uh, obviously, people are feeling a little fatigued of what the format looks like right now. Um, and this is a pretty experimental format. Uh, they haven't had Dynamax. They've had Dynamax in every single format on Sword and Shield until this one. So I want to talk about and speculate a little bit about what the format might look like um, going into what will be VGC 2022. But in order to do that, I need to talk about VGC 2021 and basically like what happened in the past year. Uh, and again, what went well, what went poorly. And so looking back, I think that C Series 7 was actually a, a really fantastic format, Series 9 as well. Um, in the end, I think we started to get a little fatigued of this as well, but that was after six months of this format. Um, and like Joe mentioned in his twit longer, uh, this is unusual for the uh, Sword and Shield games, where the formats have been a lot shorter. Um, but it, honestly, 
the fact that series nine went on for series seven and series nine together went on for about six months was really just perfect. I think that was the perfect amount of time. Um, the, the format was really interesting. It kept adapting the teams that this, so this video is from the very beginning of series nine, um, looking at back at the top series 10 teams. And a lot of the teams that I have here just were not present when you move forward. This, this one was, but they just were not present when you started to move on to series nine, like the metagame adapted three months into the metagame significantly. And so like, for example, um, the P2 Glastrier Good Stuffs was one of the teams that I really hyped up um, because it had done really well towards the end of the format. This team is just non-existent in series nine. Um, it is just nowhere to be seen. And I think that's so cool um, that the metagame kept adapting, kept innovating. The teams that did well in Players' Cup three uh, the regional stages did not necessarily do well in the uh, the global stage. Um, there were a bunch of teams that were created in the meantime. The teams that did well in the global stage didn't necessarily translate to Series 9, it could, the exception, obviously, of Colossal. Um, in the form, We just kept finding new techs, new innovation, new teams. Um, it was just a really, really interesting format. Again, in the end, I don't think it was ever solved, but if you look at the teams that did well in Players' Cup 4, uh, a lot of them they were very diverse. They just, just had a lot of different Pokemon. And that was kind of the hallmark of this format was that it was a very diverse format. Uh, you had a lot of different viable ways to build the team. Um, and the centralizing Pokemon at the end of the day was the combination of basically like Reggie Elki as a Dynamax threat was really, really common, uh, prim either as a primary or secondary Dynamax. You had a lot of very powerful Max Airstream mods that would go with it, such as the Landorus Therian, which obviously is really good into Reggie Elki. You see Moltres doing really well. Um, and then you see uh, there was a lot of Celesteela at one point in the format as well. And so that was kind of the, the primary dynamic that the format had. Um, and then you also have these really powerful steel types, namely like Registeel against Celesteela. We see some Ferrothorn. Um, and so it was a, I just, all in all, this format was really good. Like it, again, it got tiring at the ending, partially because you couldn't team build to beat the format. It didn't ever centralize. And that does make it really hard to team build. But for me, um, I think this format was one where if you found a team that you really enjoyed, you would have a great time and you can just keep using it. Um, that's kind of what I did, even though the team wasn't very good. I had a great time towards the end of the format, just playing with my like really hyper offensive team. Um, I, I brought it to Players' Cup. I brought it to Locals. I didn't do especially well in Players' Cup, but uh, I had a good time with it. And uh, I think a lot of the players who did well in Players' Cup also had a similar mentality. I know Fevzi, for example, was talking about on stream that uh, he was going to bring this team if he couldn't find anything better, but he was very, very comfortable with the team that he brought. And of course he piloted to a third place finish. Um, and I think that again, comfort really was the key there. Again, same with Kevin. Um, he had been using this team for a really long time in the Victory Road Tournament, had done very consistently well there, and then of course brought the team. And another team that was really based on comfort was uh, Nick Safrenik's team, who he came on the channel for his team report and uh, talked about how you know he'd been using a variant of this team since Series 7 and had continuously adapted it as the metagame had changed. Uh, and so it, I think this format was cool. It just it kept team building was always interesting in this format, and that's kind of what I really valued and it was fun to play. It really was fun to play. And then on the other hand, you had series eight and then later series 10, which is what we're in right now. Um, and these formats were very different because I think series eight was pretty fun to start out. Um, we had a, like a, it was the first time we had been able to use these restricted Pokemon in a Dynamax format. And so we had a lot to learn. Um, it was cool to see, for example, like Laprisation be the dominant team at the beginning of the format, and then at the end of it, it had completely fallen off. However, this format is not something that we should revisit, just because it is not a fun format as it has concluded. Um, it was it was interesting to see the development. It was interesting to see the innovations. I am I am proud to say that I played a decent sized part of innovating in this format, be it like using Dragapultization, um, as well as using the uh, sort of Groudon Venusaur teams that ended up becoming very common. But these weren't like me and my team building buddies figuring these things out. These were like continuous slight developments on existing teams that slowly got more and more optimized until you ended up with the format that was just Venusaur. There are three teams that you could use at the end of the format, really. You could use a some variant of Venusaur. Um, there were a bunch of different variants of Venusaur you could use, but you had to use Venusaur. You could use Colossal, 
Um, and as you can see from the Players' Cup 3 results, Colossal did very well in the regional stages, and then people kind of figured out their game plans. And I think Venusaur, um, you could make it so that at worst you had an even matchup against Colossal uh, once you built it. I think John's team with Kyogre had a very positive matchup against Colossal, um, the way he played it. and Or you could use Calyrex Shadow. And those were the three options. Calyrex Shadow was very uniquely positioned because of all this residual damage, and uh, it's the one Pokemon that doesn't care about how much dam what percentage of HP it's at. It it this it's the same effect if it's at fifty percent HP or twenty percent HP or seventy percent HP. It's probably going down to a single hit, but it's going to take a KO first. And so it didn't really care about the residual damage. It was a very fast paced team. That being said. Every single team had two dark types to deal with the fact that Calyrex Shadow was maybe the one piece of counterplay to this like dominance of Venusaur. And again, if you look at the teams from Players Cup 3, John used Venusaur on Kyogre teams. You have the next two people using Venusaur Groudon teams. Um, uh, there was a Calyrex Shadow. Uh, Agati's team was pretty unique. Um, and then another Calyrex Shadow, another Groudon Venusaur, Colossal, Groudon Venusaur, Colossal. Um, and then players who didn't do too well, uh, well, also Calyrex Shadow, Venusaur, and then players who went 0-2. And even the uh, Victory Road Circuit finale, which was also really high quality gameplay, was dominated by none other than Venusaur. In this case, on Zacian teams uh, or on Groudon teams, it, it was just it was just everywhere. Um, and it, that was kind of how the format ended. I think if we revisited this format, it is going to just be um, Venusaur stuff. Uh, that's just kind of how we left Dynamax. Was unless it's this very fast-paced, hyper-offensive metagame like we saw in series uh, in series ten, uh, excuse me, series nine, um, the re effective residual damage is so so powerful. Um, and that was maybe like a lesson that we've learned over the last two years of playing with Dynamax. Um, and it really begs the question: What's next? Because we have this dyna non-Dynamax format right now, and people aren't enjoying it. And we have another year of Sword and Shield where we don't know what's going to happen, but we know that we're probably going to have another four series with, you know, three or four different formats that we have to play. And so I did want to speculate a little bit about what we might see uh, over the course of the next year. Oh, I should also mention, this is an especially relevant conversation because we might get real life events back soon. I think that the, the Pokemon company wants to host Worlds this year. I don't think they want to keep pushing it back any further. Um, I think that I mean, it's so hard to speculate about how the world is doing right now, especially given um, how many places play Pokemon and you really want all of them to be on a level playing field as far as events go. But that being said, um, I also play Yu-Gi-Oh! And Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, it just got leaked that they are planning on hosting a international level event in January in California. So, you know, like if Yu-Gi-Oh! is doing it and Pokemon is, you know, a competitor, a trading card game in that respect, and really the VGC just follows suit for the TCG, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we ended up having uh, regional level events coming back starting in the winter part of the season. And so with that in mind, um, it is just really important to figure out how to keep people engaged because people are not really playing right now. And this is kind of the inherent problem with VGC. It always gets a huge influx of players at the beginning of a generation and then slowly drops off. And I'm sure that IRL events will spike back up popularity just because people want to experience them. But if the events aren't fun and if the formats aren't fun, um, it's going to be hard to keep people playing. And we might go back to having the like 70 person regionals that we had at the very ending of 2019. And so I really don't want that to be the introduction to events that people have, uh, especially towards the end of the year. And with that in mind, I want to talk about some of the sort of different formats that we could have. And so one of the things that people have been throwing around is that with Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl coming out, they might expand the Pokédex in Sword and Shield and introduce some of the new Pokémon that haven't been released yet. Um, to which I say, that is not going to be a difference in VGC. I'm sorry. The Pokemon that aren't out yet are not very good. There are very few Pokemon that are going to impact the metagame. Is there really going to be a fire type that's better than Incineroar? Is there going to be a grass type better than Rillaboom or Amoongus? Is there going to be a water type or a fighting type better than Urshifu? Like, maybe there's a water type here or there. Um, there's definitely some interesting things you can do with these starters, but the Gen 4 starters are, like, not very good. Like, Infernape saw, has saw, seen VGC play, but it's not as good as Urshifu. You know, like, uh, there's... Uh, wh who is... Like, which Pokemon is really going to make a difference, you know? So if we go back to Series 9 with uh, just this slightly ex expanded Dex, it's just going to be Series 9. And I don't think that people really want to see that. So I don't think they're going to do that. I also don't think they're going to expand the Pokédex necessarily. But uh, even if they do, 
it, it might not happen. Another thing that we might see potentially uh, it would be just like a really restricted decks. Um, and so they have somewhat arbitrarily cut Pokemon out of the Pokedex for formats before, specifically with Series 6, where they banned the top 10 Pokemon in the format. And that was not a good format. That was maybe the, in my opinion, VGC 2020 was really fun. And that was maybe the one bad format that we had in VGC 2020, even though that is, you know, my biggest tournament win that I personally can can hang my hat on. Um, that format, by banning the top Pokemon, it turns out that the... Uh, it's very easy to replace offensive Pokemon with slightly worse offensive Pokemon. It's a lot harder to replace good defensive Pokemon with slightly worse defensive Pokemon. Um, and so by banning Incineroar and by banning Rillaboom, by banning, I think, Amoong... Amoong is actually stuck around. But but by banning a lot of the really powerful defensive options, you left uh, offensive teams with very, very few things that they need to actually power through. And it turned into like this firefight um, where can your offensive options beat everyone else's offensive options and sort of a roulette format um, that, like, people complain about Series 9 and, and the, like, somewhat roulette hyper-offensive nature of that format, but Series 6 was just, like, way, way worse version of that. Um, and so I can't imagine they're going to ban Pokemon arbitrarily, but um, a couple things they could do. If they had to, like, ban Pokemon, I hope would hope they do it with a, a little more intention, um, obviously Smogon does a really good job of that when they are, you know, creating their own tiers and crafting them so that they are as fun as possible. Um, the other way they could do it is just try to emulate the, uh, Diamond Pearl or the Sinnoh decks and just limit us to those Pokemon, um, even though we're not playing in those games. And that might be an interesting format as well for maybe one season, but I can't imagine that would be a long-term thing. Um, it would be a cool way of bringing us back to the original decks formats that we had, you know, in like 2017 or at the beginning of 2020, where you have these like very limited pool of Pokemon. I always think those are very exciting and uh, there's always a lot of creativity when those happen. However, I think a more realistic situation is uh, going to be that we have a series nine, but without Dynamax. So just a no, uh, no restricted Pokemon non-Dynamax format. And we've actually seen a number of events that are similar to this held by grassroots tournaments. Um, the most notable ones being uh, the Battle Frontier hosted by Joe and Necra. However, they banned Urshifu and Gothitelle from their tournament. And the reason they did that is because of the uh, Wacka World Tour circuit that happened previously, where uh, it was a like more of a like, for fun team tournament that happened. Uh, and one of the formats that we played in was non-Dynamax. Um, and the first iteration had everything allowed and the second iteration just banned Urshifu, I believe, um, because it turns out that Urshifu Gothitelle was just really, really powerful. It was it was incredibly powerful. Um, Goth the Pokemon in the game have been balanced with Dynamax in mind. Pokemon like Urshifu should not exist in a non-Dynamax format. Hitting through Protect is so powerful, when, especially when your Pokemon can't suddenly double in HP or like max guard to not go get hit through protect um and then same with fake out on a shadow tagmon it is just an absurd amount of power in a format like this and i'll be honest like it's it's not that fun to play um if you think that this format is bad i think that like a gothitelle urshifu and cinderwar dominated format is going to be probably even worse um if they, again, if they crafted it, it could be really fun. I know the tour that uh, Joe and Necra hosted was was really interesting. Of course, that was just one tournament at the very beginning of a relatively undiscovered format. And I suspect that it turns out that in Cinderwar Rillaboom, the same threats that are dominating Series 10, because they have double fake out and pivoting, are going to be very good even when the power level decreases. And um, yeah, I just think that we're going to see a lot of Incineroar Rillaboom if that happens, and a lot of like Entei, just like we're seeing in Series 10, because that Pokemon can uh, is immune to Intimidate and immune to Fake Out. So that's kind of what I expect if we see that format. I think that is going to realistically be one of the series, and honestly, I, I'm not looking forward to it. Just like the existence of Gothitelle or Shifu is going to be so painful, and we're going to find that out really quickly. And so... That is one potential outcome. The next potential outcome is another non-restricted, uh, non-Dynamax format, but with two restricteds. And I think this would be really fun. I think that uh, you, it's a lot harder to formulate a fire, water, grass core in series 10 if you had two restricted Pokemon, um, because there aren't really any powerful fire type restricteds, and there certainly aren't any um, 
powerful water type restricted, right? Except, I mean, there's Kyogre, but um, at that point, you can do more proactive things with Kyogre. Uh, you might still run the Fire Water Grass Core with Kyogre, but uh, uh, other than Kyogre teams, you're not going to see that as much. Like, will Xerneas probably run Incineroar Rillaboom? Yes, but then they have a second restricted Pokemon instead of the water type. And so um, it's you're not going to be able to, like, play this controlling gameplay where you have one restricted because your opponent has two of them. Um, and it's going to be harder to fit these defensive typings on when you really want to use the limited pool of powerful Pokemon. Uh, and so I think that actually would balance it out a lot. I'm hoping that we see that, but there is a good reason why they don't do two restricted formats. And that is that uh, the way that the game is coded, the limitations of Sword and Shield have it such that Battle Spot singles and Battle Spot doubles will have the same ban list. That's why Series 6 banned the top 10 Pokemon from each format and not just and, and had one combined ban list even though it makes no sense to do it that way and that's why we're having uh one restricted format instead of two is because having two restricteds in a bring six pick three singles format um it sounds like it's going to be awful and so i think that they're trying to cater to singles players by not um having this two restricted format that we all know and love and so with that in mind, I don't think that's going to happen, but I think that is maybe one of the best possible outcomes, just because it would not have Dynamax, but also reduce the monotony of the existing format and make us explore these new interesting synergies that we haven't really had a chance to play with. Of course, another option is that they do the same thing with two Restricteds, but also have Dynamax. There have been some online tournaments that fit this description, um, some ladder tours, I believe. I haven't really paid attention to them. I suspect this format would be very unhealthy just because of like the power level of restricted and Dynamax making it really, really hard to play defensively. I don't entirely know, um, but I imagine that there are going to be some crazy synergies that allow you to, I don't know, like exploit Caloric Shadow. And can you imagine clicking Max Phantasm into Precipice Blades? That just sounds crazy. Um, and so I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that, but I also don't necessarily think that's going to happen for the same reason. Just having multiple restricted kind of breaks singles. And then the last thing I want to throw out there is a format that potentially has mythical Pokemon. We've never had a VGC format that allows mythical Pokemon, and I think that might change. I really do. I mean, obviously, they have the uh, the problem where they are very difficult to get in-game, but that being said, uh, it's, it's something that would be really interesting to see, and I think that there are ways that you can make it more accessible, especially with Pokemon Bank with things like Pokemon Go allowing you to capture mythical Pokemon and transfer them with things like uh, Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl allowing you to transfer mythical Pokemon um, with potentially events on the virtual console games. It would be a lot of ways for uh, Pokemon to distribute these Pokemon really easily. And um, let's be real, VGC players, especially at the highest level, do not have a problem catching these Pokemon. And at a lower level, uh, it is going to be difficult to play in a restricted format anyways. Um, would mythicals really be that bad? I think it'd be really interesting. It'd be very different. Um, and if we're trying to fill four series worth of time, um, this would be a way to like really change it up, force us to team build. And even if it's like not very interesting at the end of it, even if like, I don't know, like Magearna is a broken Pokemon, it really shouldn't exist in doubles. But um, even if the format turns into like Magearna and we figure out the best way to play Magearna, um, it's still going to be an interesting learning curve. And that's what made Series 8 fun, despite the fact that it ended up in a bad place, is that um, I think that it was just like a fun innovation process because we hadn't done it before. And so that's kind of my thoughts. I also think that we could just reasonably revisit Series 9, Series 8, Series 10, but I really don't want that. So, so those are my ideas. If you have ideas for what the, the future formats in VGC could be uh, over the next year, type them out in the comments. Let me know because I'm really interested to hear what you think about this. I'm interested to hear about uh, any other potential ideas for what the formats might look like. Um, and yeah, I don't really have a great way to wrap this video up, but thank you all for watching. And until next time, I will see you all later.